It's Ray. Welcome or welcome back to my channel and to my January wrap-up video. So for my January books, I'm going to split it into two parts, adult literature and YA slash children's fiction. The first book that I want to talk about could easily be already the best book that I've read this whole year. I read it obviously at the beginning of January. I'm making this video halfway through February and I have not been able to stop thinking about it. That book is Do Not Say We Have Nothing by Madeleine Thane. It came out in 2016, it was long listed, I believe, for the Booker Prize. I feel like it should have won. And it is a kind of dual slash multi-narrative story, which goes from approximately the beginning of Mao Zedong's ruling in China at the end of the 1940s up to the present day. So the story starts off in Canada being told in first person by a 10 year old girl called Mali and her family has just experienced a great tragedy. Into the mix very quickly comes a girl called Ai Ming from China and she is a refugee from the Tiananmen Square uprising. From this point the narrative starts to jump into multiple other narratives which look back through both of these girls family histories, the way that the lives of their parents have been connected to each other and it kind of explores the effect of history as it rolls down through the generations. This book was just so well done. It was one of those situations where you get something grand, something that sets itself out on a huge scale and succeeds. This book is not magical realism, but it felt to me like it crawled right up to the edges of magical realism and kind of drank at the stream a little bit. So it explores a lot the theme and the interplay of history and memory. Throughout the book, there are these books called the Books of Records that one of the characters early on transcribes. And as we see the narrative unfold, these Books of Records are gradually changed and adapted. And we can see parallels between the lives of our real characters and between the lives of these kind of mythical characters who exist in the Book of Records. The Books of Records, of course, also during the Chinese Cultural Revolution become something which are a clandestine item that shouldn't exist anymore and it's just so fascinating how this book uses multiple symbolisms it uses like maths it uses the intricacies of the Chinese language and it looks at the way that we hide and tuck meaning and memory away in different places and the way that this memory can be warped and can be changed by individuals and particularly the way that society and the culture in which we live impacts who we are as a person alongside this a huge theme in the book is music so a lot of the plot takes place in the Shanghai Concert during the Cultural Revolution and our characters are extremely talented musicians at a time where they feel a sense of outside constraint upon the sort of music that they want to write and Dane looks amazingly at this interplay between music and life the way that music is like this other place that the characters can go to that they have this kind of relationship with the way that the music is in their soul the way that it molds and shapes the way they think so the narrative switches between Molly's first person narrative in the present and most of the story is then back in time doing third person narratives looking at Marley and Ai Ming's family's histories. And at this point, even though the book is in third person, Thane does this incredible thing with each character, often where we get an insight into their thoughts by them asking themselves a load of rhetorical questions and you just get such a core sense of who these characters are and what their internal struggles are and you feel like the landscape of their mind exists in reality for you. On top of this, the characters were just incredible. Zuli in particular, particular for me just had all my heart and I still think about her every day. The writing style was beautiful and even though as I'm sure you can imagine this is a book about the Chinese Cultural Revolution, the Tiananmen Square Massacre and the effects of those things on the characters living at the time and the knock-on effect that they had onto their families in the future. This is not a happy novel but it's not without optimism because it really truly shows the depth with which human beings can and do love in any hardship and the way that humans can and will make connections and can and will hold on to the things that are important to them and matter to them whatever the outside circumstances are this was seriously like a full-on five stars wonderful please go and read it if you haven't done yet i cannot wait to read more of thane's writing next up another five star read this was a reread and so it's not a shock to me that this was a five star read although i am relieved because this was absolutely my favourite book as a teenager, but it's been a solid 
eight years or so since I last read it, and I was kind of worried that I wouldn't love it so much anymore. That novel is, of course, Jane Eyre. I've got this good edition, my solid old one that I had since I was a teenager that I love with all my heart for all its battered glory. I also have this beautiful new edition new to me, but not new to the world, that my soon-to-be mother-in-law bought for me for Christmas. It's just got this gorgeous kind of ethereal cover which really captures the gothic nature of Jane and I think also her kind of willowy strength, which is quite often referred to in the novel. And there's a beautiful frontispiece in here too of Jane and Rochester. Then I have behind me this framed cover of an old Jane Eyre novel and of course my Jane Eyre mug for my tea. So, we're ready to talk about Jane. I make sure that all of my reviews are spoiler free, but I would say that if you have not read Jane Eyre before in your life, just go and read it. Like, don't even listen to my review of it. It's gripping, it's fascinating, it's beautifully written. It is the classic classic. So Jane Eyre follows the life of its eponymous protagonist, obviously Jane Eyre, from her childhood as an orphan into her young adulthood and the experiences that she has. First off, living as an orphan with her wealthy aunt who does not love or want her, then her education at harsh and cruel Lowood School, and on to her life as a governess at Thornfield Hall with its mysterious master, Mr. Rochester. This novel is very much part of the Bildungsroman genre where we see a protagonist growing up from youth into young adulthood, stroke adulthood, and we see their development throughout that. This is really, really well done in Jane Eyre. We see so clearly how she develops and changes and how her personality kind of both mellows and strengthens from her childhood into her adulthood. And we kind of witness how the experience that she has of growing up helps to shape and mold her into that person to an extent, but also how her own inner strengths and fortitude shines through throughout so many challenges that she faces. And while she is in many occasions quite an isolated and lonely character without people to turn to for guidance and support, the quote, in fact, on the back of my edition says, the more solitary, the more friendless, the more unsustained I am, the more I will respect myself. One of the things that I was kind of worried about coming back to Jane Eyre, having not read it for so long, is that when I first read this, the romance in this book took hold of me and did not let go. And I just felt like, here is love. And then having been away from the novel for quite a while and reflected on quite a few things from outside of it, I kind of went back feeling a bit anxious that I wouldn't actually feel like what was portrayed in this novel is love. I definitely do think that there are enormously problematic aspects to the relationship between Jane and Rochester, which is really the central part of this novel. But at the same time, I really don't take back my initial reaction, which was that this book portrays the way that love exists as a meeting of two equal minds. The conversations between Jane and Rochester are long, they're extended, and I feel like so few novels do this and really show you the way that love develops over a period of time through these heartfelt, soul-felt interactions between two people, rather than just these tropes of kind of being attracted to the outside face of somebody. This novel very much goes against that. Also, Charlotte Bronte and her writing here does this magnificent job of engaging you as the reader, so obviously she kind of famously addresses you as reader. And often I find that this kind of meta-narrative style where the author reminds you that what you're reading is a story sort of pushes me out of the book a bit because it kind of breaks my suspension of disbelief. But no, in this novel I just feel so included, I feel so wrapped up, I feel like Jane is talking to me, just me, like nobody else in the world exists. And even though I know that so many people have read and loved this novel, it still feels to me like there is a string beneath my breast that links me to this novel and it's a private and special thing. This book also deals with fascinating issues. It's an extremely feminist book in many ways. It also has a fascinating examination of religion and the role of men in religion. So Jane is a very religious person and religion in this book is something that she holds tightly to. However, there are also multiple representations of patriarchal, domineering, religious men who are clearly 
manipulative. Not to mention Mr. Rochester's own relationship with religion and with custom. The only thing that kind of annoyed me in this book when I listened to it was not the story at all, but just the narration. I listened to a version on Audible by Thandie Newton. It was available for free. She narrated it totally fine, but I just have a bit of a gripe about the fact that Jane spoke in a completely RP Queen's English kind of way, because having seen the National Theatre adaptation of Jane Eyre, it just brought home to me how much of a part of Jane is her Yorkshire identity and the fact that she was educated at a school for orphans and for the poor daughters of clergy in the north of England definitely makes me think that she would have grown up with a regional accent and I don't know I just feel like that is kind of a part of her identity as a part of the landscape of the novel and that is very much how I imagine her speaking and it annoys me when she doesn't speak with that accent because I think you know had she been Scottish or Irish or something else then you very much would give her that accent and that regional identity that she I I felt was kind of denied in the audiobook version that I listened to. Yeah, that was just like a minor, minor gripe that annoyed me. Apart from that, what a delight to re-listen to Jane Eyre. What a wonderful novel. I'm so grateful that it is a part of my life. Moving into the YA children's literature section, the next book that I read, this was actually the first book that I read in the year, is A Snowfall of Silver by Laura Wood. How beautiful are the covers of Laura Wood's YA books? I just cannot get over them. I raved quite a lot last year about Under a Dancing Star, which was the first book that I read by Laura Wood, and it kind of cemented her in my mind as a go-to comfort read author for me. And Snowfall of Silver did not disappoint. I very much enjoyed it. I read it on my long haul flight from the UK back to the Congo after Christmas. It was generally quite a miserable flight because it was long haul, it was overnight, it was during COVID and I got a progressively worsening migraine as the journey went on. However, I still really, really enjoyed reading this book during that time and it was some nice escapism. It tells a story of an 18 year old girl called Freya who runs away from her family in Cornwall to London to become an actress in the 1930s. And what Wood does that I just absolutely adore is she really captures the wonder and the marvel an 18 year old has for the world and the enthusiasm and the excitement and the passion. And I find that reading that like 10 years on in life just takes me back to all of those emotions that I used to have and reopens my eyes to the wonder and the magic of the world. And for me, that is the thing that these books do most perfectly and that is what I absolutely love it for. So like for example, her description of getting off the train in London and she's looking at all of the other commuters and they look bored and they look tired and she's thinking, like, wake up, we're in London, can't you see? This is incredible. And I have definitely been both Freya and the tired, grumpy commuter. And it's nice to have the reminder of how wonderful the world is. Like, I know that mindfulness is obviously a big trend these days, but for me, literature has always been my mindfulness. And those characters who reopen your eyes to the magic and wonder of the world do that so nicely for me. Another thing that I really enjoyed in Wood's work was the fact that the characters go on a tour of the UK. I feel like so much writing about the UK is really London focused and I'm not from London. <laughs> It was just super lovely to see the tour stopping off at like Nottingham, which was my hometown, and at Durham, which was my university town. The romance aspect in this book was super sweet as well. Wood very much looks at the importance of friendships and of mutual support over and above kind of dashingly handsome, super attractive, strike me down men. Also, I was something of a theatre kid, or at least a ballet kid when I was growing up, so I could definitely really appreciate and enjoyed all of the references to performance and the adrenaline of the performance, the way the air tastes backstage, the magic of watching in the wings, that kind of just electric atmosphere of the theatre. And there was a lot in this novel that made you ache to read it during the pandemic. There was so much human closeness, there were bustling pubs and sleeping in tightly packed rooms and parties and just, yeah, so much kind of human contact and interaction that we've lost during the pandemic existed very powerfully in this novel and really made me ache for getting back to normality. If you like Eva Ibbotson, Dottie Smith, that kind of writing, you will really love this. Okay, and lastly, onto children's literature. Another reread for me was The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett and I enjoyed this so incredibly much. It tells the story of orphan Mary Lennox who comes from India to the Yorkshire Moors. Quite a lot of Yorkshire Moors in my life in January which I very much enjoyed. She starts off as this miserable, sour child. She's been spoiled but she's never really been loved and as the title suggests she discovers a secret garden and through her interaction with the 
healing and blooming of the natural world and also the friendships that she develops both with the wildlife and also eventually with the humans who surround her there. She and other characters heal and grow and blossom and this is just such a classic and a masterpiece. If you're feeling like your faith in humankind is ebbing then read this, it totally restores it, it completely warms your heart. Something that I particularly enjoyed is the way that Hodgson Burnett doesn't treat her children as if they're not children. So a lot of Mary's inner thoughts and reflections are one of a child and particularly one of a child who is learning and starting to question, for example, her own selfishness. And we really see her growth, but at no point does she kind of demonstrate like her wisdom beyond her years or anything. She's very much just a child. And I love the way that this book shows how healthy outdoor play and love and boundaries can give children strength and energy and joy that they would otherwise have lacked and how being given everything that they want isn't good for children. Again, as a reread, rereading is something that I feel like I'm kind of getting into a bit this year. For so long I've kind of shied away from rereading because I feel like there's so much out there that I want to read desperately for the first time and that rereading is somehow taking away from that, but rereading Jane Eyre and The Secret Garden has just brought me so much joy and I've seen so many things that I otherwise wouldn't have noticed, like for example in this book Martha. I completely forgotten her. She's a servant who just develops this close relationship with Mary and definitely gives her moral support and guidance and teaches her so many things in a kind and loving and enthusiastic way. And she just totally passed over my head as a child, but looking at her again as an adult, I can kind of see things that characters in this book are doing and think, okay, how can I take that on board myself and how can I exhibit these qualities more in my own interactions with the children in my life? So yeah, it was just a super lovely read also. This folio edition is just an absolute stunner, so that added to it very much indeed. The final book of the month is The Enchanted Castle by E. Nesbitt. It's really interesting because The Enchanted Castle and The Secret Garden came out at quite similar times, and yet to me The Enchanted Castle felt so dated and The Secret Garden feels so not dated. Like, the Enchanted Castle is quite famous five-esque in terms of all of the childhood slang. You know, all the like, Jiminy Cricket, Jerry! Let's eat our sandwiches and ham! That kind of thing. This was a really interesting novel. It was quite bizarre, to be honest. I don't really know how else to describe it. So there's these three children, and they end up having to stay at a boarding school over the summer holidays because somebody at home has measles. And so off they go on an adventure. These children discover a magic ring. And the book then follows the adventures of these children and the magic ring. And I remember this being a really strong theme in The Five Children and It as well. This kind of be careful what you wish for is definitely a big theme. Children wish for things and then there's various mishaps that happen because they wished for such and such a thing. And then they sort it all out and then some another child wishes for something else and on and on it goes. The plot in that sense did start to feel a bit repetitive um, and it did also just get like progressively weirder and weirder. There's a real dark streak beneath Nesbitt's writing. There's particularly these characters who come up in it called the Ugly Wugglies and honestly I couldn't tell whether they were funny or like absolutely terrifying. So I think if you're a super sensitive child, as in the kind of child that I was when I was a child, I would probably avoid it. This story is really fascinating in the way that it kind of plays with reality and imagination and I also love the fact that Nesbitt was writing for children who are on that cusp of an age where like imagination and reality are just starting to level out with one another. You know when like you're playing imaginative games but you kind of do know that it's just imagination, that it's not real, but you also want to believe that it's real and sometimes when you're by yourself and your friends are around, you really do believe it's real and you're like, haha, in spite of them, I know that this magical world of mine really does exist. So it's kind of written for children of that age and it very much plays with that concept of reality and fiction. Alongside this, there is very much this like pure, simple comedy. There's a lot of humour at the expense of adults in a really perceptive way, lots of kind of adults doubting children when children are actually right and telling the truth. Um, there was a comment at one point about how, you know, adults expect you to believe these really bizarre things like the fact that the earth is round, when at the same time they won't believe you if you tell them that you have an invisible friend. And there were lots of just like really lovely perceptive and deep points like that scattered throughout the novel. Yeah, it's very magical, it's very much about the power of the mind. I've been reading a lot of early 20th century and 19th century children's 
fiction lately and one of the things that I guess is worth noting from so much of it is just that like it's not all aged well. There is one moment in this book where one of the children uses blackface in order to perform as an Indian performer at some event. Even in fact in The Secret Garden she initially comes from India and some of the comments of the servants regarding their perception of India also are very outdated so I guess that's just something to be aware of with both of these novels. The more up-to-date of the stuff that I've read, like Laura Wood's book for example, definitely deals a lot more sensitively with topics like race and sexuality. So yeah, The Enchanted Castle, I don't really know how much I enjoyed it, but there was definitely stuff in there to admire, and I think for a certain type of child they would find it absolutely wonderful. So that's everything that I read in January, thank you so very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video!